Okay, so I am now going to introduce uh, senior research scientist at the National Center for Earth and Space Science Educa Education, Dr. Timothy Livengood. And uh, Dr. Tim and I, we've been working together for, um, oh, I'm sorry, there you are. We've been working together for, what, a decade now? 18 years. 18 years? <laughs> the way he said it, it was like, it was 18 years, Jeff. And uh, so uh, Tim actually did a lot of the development work for the uh, curriculum support material for this program. The, uh, I guess uh, Harry did the case studies document, but the original microgravity science document was done by Tim. And uh, I just want to introduce him that he's going to talk to you about his uh, space-based research, which I think you're going to find way cool. So Tim. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. All right, so I went to graduate school and, no, okay, so first of all, anybody here ever read anything by Ann Tyler, so at least the joke on the screen makes a little sense? Okay, so anyway, I, that was a failed joke. I went, to, uh, I went to graduate school in Baltimore. One of our uh, favorite daughters is Ann Tyler and her novel, The Accidental Tourist. Well, this is actually not so much a, a specific science report, as a report on work I've been doing for the past three years or so. So uh, the actual title is The Accidental Observatory over here, uh, because that's what I've been working I've been working with a spacecraft that was not intended to be an observatory, but has been anyway. So in 2005, uh, a very special little spacecraft called Deep Impact, con consisting of two parts, a flyby spacecraft and the ominously named impactor. Uh, launched in January of 2005. In June, it separated into two pieces, the impactor flying off on its own towards that possibly worrisome looking thing in the background, uh, with the flyby spacecraft then firing its motors to take a slightly different trajectory, so that on the 4th of July, boom! <laughs> or to, to say it properly for fans of Looney Tunes like me, Kaboom! There was an earth shattering. Kaboom! <laughs> Thank you. Technically not an earth shattering kaboom, more of a comet tapping kaboom. Uh, but the purpose of the experiment was to fly the impactor, which was basically a, the size of a washing machine made of pennies. Uh, a copper object ran into the comet. The reason is that there's not a lot of observed comet, copper coming from comets. So any copper you see, you say, that's our impactor. The idea was to dig into the surface and find out what comets are really made out of by blowing it out into space. I can tell you the mission got its name before the movie went into development, but the movie came out before the mission actually launched. It takes a long time to prepare a flight mission. And so while this was happening with the big comet tapping kaboom, the flyby spacecraft observed the process, uh, after which there was a perfectly adequate spacecraft left with no job. Uh, just orbiting the sun uh, on its way to, well, nowhere, really. All right, so that flyby spacecraft, uh, it actually went on, well, okay, so it was launched in January. It made, had its impact point with Comet Temple 1, was the original comet. Uh, it's actually down at the bottom of the screen over there now. I could only just barely fit it in. Uh, it, and then over the next two years, uh, with some pressure from the original experiment team, uh, NASA bought into the idea of allowing more experiment teams to propose new things to do with this perfectly good spacecraft that was just out there. I mean, this is a, an unprecedented thing. It's very odd for NASA to have a spacecraft that is able to do an entirely new mission. Usually, they've landed on something, they've run into something, they've flown out into space. It's, it's odd to have something entirely new that you can do with it. But that was our project. And so uh, over those two years, uh, there were actually two proposals made for it. And we were combined in a forced marriage, whose name I'll give you in a moment. And so we began our work actually in the very beginning. On, at, we, there was a flyby of Earth uh, right on the last day of 2007, uh, at which point the spacecraft actually went into an orbit still around the sun, but very close to Earth. Okay, so the instruments we had, we have a medium resolution camera, and because this is NASA, everything has an acronym. 
So we have a medium resolution instrument, or MRI. We have a high resolution instrument visible imaging system, the HRI VIS, and the high resolution instrument infrared spectroradiometer. Okay, so an infrared spectrometer. All right, so we had two things. We had EPOC, Extrasolar Planetary Observation and Characterization, and Dixie, the Deep Impact Extended Investigation. And when you mix your components together, you get epoxy. And then when they cut our budget, we called ourselves duct tape. <laughs> actually, that was, that was actually the principal investigator's joke. We, we kind of liked it. Uh, EPOC can't actually see we can't see an extrasolar planet. It is a planet that's orbiting a star that isn't our own. Uh, they're just too tiny. And actually, our telescope is about that big. It's a little 30 centimeter telescope. You could get a telescope the same size, uh, well, not from your average department store, but fairly easily. Uh, except that actually the one you would go out and you would buy by mail order or from the birding store or whatever would be better because ours is defocused. Uh, not on purpose. It turns out the guys from Ball Aerospace have admitted that they have learned an important lesson, which is always include a focus mechanism. <laughs> it's not as good as you thought it is. Uh, the thing is, though, for some of what we were doing, a defocused telescope is actually better. If you want to stare at something like a star and collect as much light as possible, it turns out it's actually helpful if you spread out the light over the detector at the back of the camera. So for that particular project, it was actually better to have a blurry camera than to have a good one. So what we were doing, we were measuring the light from stars that were known to have planets orbiting them in order to get a much better measurement of what we call the light curve than what you could do from the surface of the Earth. So even though it's a crummy little telescope, it's a crummy little telescope in space. And being in space is a huge advantage. Okay, so these are an example of the, the stuff we measure. You know, it, it's, yeah, Okay, this is squiggly line plots. But what we do is over the period of about two to three weeks, we would just measure the light from the star just over and over and over again. Uh, a human being would be, you, you, you might actually go into a coma from boredom. Uh, our, my description of it is that if data collection is not boring, you're not doing it right. It should be as dull as possible. There should be no surprises. Uh, and that's exactly what we got. That's what we were aiming for. The idea was just every 50 seconds, we, we finished taking one picture and we started another 50 second exposure on a star. Thousands and thousands, we actually end up, I think, with 110,000 images, almost all of which are just staring at stars and just measuring the light really carefully in order to measure. So each of these little dips that you see here is a decrease in the brightness of the light from the star. The smallest one of these is uh, less than a tenth of a percent of the light of the star was blocked by a planet going between us and the star. And among other things, we were looking for, well, we were looking to see if there were other planets orbiting a star. This is one of the ones we were really interested in. This is a little red dwarf star with an unexciting name, GJ436. It comes from the Gliese catalog. And anyway, what we were looking for was to see if this is the main planet we know about, but you can see there's little wiggles in the data. And those little wiggles are for the most part because nothing gets measured perfectly, but just maybe there might be something else. There might be another planet orbiting that star with a different orbit than the one we were looking at. Uh, so my colleagues at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory worked through these data in a lot of detail. Long story short, yeah, no planet. But, but you have to look. You have to try or you'll never know it. Uh, the truth is, you didn't really think the odds were good that there would be something that easy to measure. Uh, there's another mission now doing something like this called Kepler. Kepler launched after us. Now Kepler, see we looked at seven planets, seven stars rather. Kepler look, is looking at 80,000 and it's measuring the light from them every five minutes for three and a half years. Uh, Kepler is going to find Earth-sized planets. Okay, Kepler has already found what we call super-Earths. Uh, this was a precursor to the Kepler mission. So something else we did. In 2008, we also got five opportunities, of which two worked, uh, sorry, of which three worked, two had problems with the spacecraft, to look at us, to look at ourselves, because it turns out we actually do not have a good record of what Earth looks like if you look at us from a long way away. And one of the things we ultimately want to do 
in what we call astrobiology now is look at Earth-like planets orbiting other stars. And to do that, we need an idea of what our planet looks like. We know what we look like up close, but that's like saying, I know what a human being looks like because I've done this. You know, it's, it's obviously difficult. So we turned around and we looked at ourselves. Uh, these images are from one example, and this is actually from what we call EarthOBS-1, because it's NASA and we have to have names like that. Uh, this is from our Earth, first Earth observation. This is sort of simulating what you would see if you could be out there in space looking at it, uh, maybe a little brighter than you and I could see. Uh, and then here's a version going into colors of light that you and I can't see, showing where all the plant life is. It turns out if you go to just a little bit longer wavelength than human color vision, uh, plant life just pops up. The problem is it turns out it only pops up if you can see the details on the planet. When you average it out over the whole planet, it turns out it's really hard to tell that there's any life on Earth. Uh, this is what we call an infrared spectrum of Earth. So this is measuring the, the, the strength of colors of light as we go into the infrared. So really it's not colors because you and I can't see it with our eyes. Uh, and each one of those dips shows you the presence of a molecule in Earth's atmosphere. There's water, there's carbon dioxide, just a little tiny dip that shows you that there's oxygen. So that's a, that's a big one. The other ones tell you it's an atmosphere. The oxygen tells you it's an atmosphere we can breathe. But it's just a little tiny dip. And measuring that on another planet and orbiting another star would be challenging. We go out in even longer infrared, we can see things like methane, which is common in the universe, but relatively rare on Earth. Uh, nitrous oxide, which on Earth comes from bacteria in dirt. So evidence for life on Earth, more squiggly lines. This is actually a measurement of the light from the Earth itself uh, as we just watch the planet turn. It turns out that one thing you could do if you were looking at your planet orbiting another star is just measure how bright it is in certain colors. And just from that alone, uh, one of our colleagues was actually able to make a map of the Earth. It's the bottom one, the bad one. Uh, it's not a great map but it's better than you could expect to get from looking at a planet orbiting another star. And so this was proof of concept that with really good data, you could do it. Now you have to figure out how to get really good data for a planet orbiting another star. It is very challenging. Uh, lastly, we were looking, I'm just gonna kind of skip through this. We were looking for what's called the vegetation red edge, what I was showing you earlier where you could see plant life on Earth. Uh, it's easy to see in plants. It turns out it's really challenging if you average a whole planet together. But one of the things we did learn from this uh, that, again, has not really been explored too much, uh, this may shock you. Earth is blue. This is more news than you might have thought. Uh, I mean, Earth is really obviously blue. If you look at Neptune and Uranus, uh, the two farthest out planets in the solar system, now that poor Pluto is gone, uh, they're blue. But they're blue for a different reason. They're blue because there's, there's molecules in the atmosphere that take the red away, so all that's left is blue. On Earth, it's because we are, we have, our atmosphere is actually more efficient at scattering blue light, but our ground is efficient at scattering red light. So we actually are the only thing in the solar system that is both red and blue, and what this is is a plot of how strongly your different planets are colored, where things that are red are farther over to the right, and things that are blue are farther up. And if you look in the upper right corner, you'll see the Earth is the only thing that is blue and red. Everything else is blue or red, or neither one. But Earth is blue and red. Now, that's modern Earth. Modern Earth has looked kind of like it does now for not that long, a few hundred million years, hardly anything. When you consider the planet is five billion years old, 500 million years is just a tenth of Earth's lifetime, but for a tenth of Earth's lifetime, it's been really distinctive from everything else in our solar system. And that's something that hadn't really been worked out before. So, you know, certainly our mission paid off in that respect. We also had something really odd, which unfortunately is not really apparent up there. I, I have to work on my graphics. Uh, but we actually saw the moon go between our spacecraft and the Earth, and we're able to watch the moon's light, rather the moon itself, block out some of the light from Earth. And that's another way you could learn about a planet orbiting another star. Let me just zip along with the skip over the moon spectrum. Skip. Boop, boop, boop. 
We did a little bit more in 2009. We got a chance to look at the Earth from the North Pole and the South Pole while the spacecraft was still dancing around with the Earth. We even got a chance to look at Mars as a comparison to see how Mars looks compared to us. Uh, and we're still working on that part of the data. Uh, yeah, we'll skip Mars. And the next thing we're going to, oh, we did do one more thing. Last October, uh, sorry, last November 4, uh, the spacecraft did the Dixie part of the mission where it made a close flyby of another comet called Comet 103P Hartley 2. Everything has names like this. Uh, it's just, you know, an anon well, it's not an anonymous comet. It has a name. It's Hartley 2. It was found by a guy named Hartley. And it was the 103rd comet discovered. Uh, that was in the 1970s. Since then, thousands have been discovered. We've become very good at that kind of thing. Uh, I just like to keep this one up because this shows something clever that you can do with modern technology. This is the blurry picture that we got from our camera. It turns out that if you have good enough data, you can fix that. And that's the fixed version. Okay, so now we're continuing. To, I mean, the spacecraft is still in orbit around the sun. Uh, and we're thinking, well, what could we do with it next? Well, over the next few years, what each of these little colored triangles is showing you is a period of time when the spacecraft is in a position where it could look at one of the asteroids in the asteroid belt. I mean, there's tens of thousands of those, but one of the big ones in the asteroid belt. Uh, we're actually looking at propo uh, proposing a second follow-on mission to NASA using the same spacecraft. Uh, we can't fly to any of these asteroids, but we can look at them from far away using it as an observatory. And we can even look at uh, Mars for a couple of months next year uh, and Jupiter uh, twice a year for about five weeks at a pop for the next forever. Uh, that's a project that's near to my heart. Jupiter has auroras like Earth has, uh, but in a different kind of gas. And one of the things I would like to learn more about as part of my work is how much energy uh, goes into Jupiter's atmosphere from its interaction with the space around it. That's what aurora really is. Because see, Jupiter is 70% of what orbits the sun. And the only part we can see is on the outside. And if that's getting cooked by radiation, then we need to know that in order to know what most of the solar system is. Because that's, Jupiter is most of the solar system. Skip that one. Okay, so, so what we've done is using a spacecraft that was not intended for this purpose, uh, we have been able to get access to planetary targets to, to study as astronomers that you just can't do from the ground in a lot of ways, and purely because this spacecraft, unlike Hubble, which is a monumentally better telescope, but Hubble is orbiting Earth, and this thing is orbiting the sun. So there are times when there are, there are objects in space that our spacecraft can see that Hubble simply can't see because the sun is in the way. There are wavelengths of light that our, our spacecraft is equipped to see that Hubble is not equipped to see because in its orbit around the Earth, uh, it's very hard, for instance, to keep a spectrometer cold enough that you can study infrared light. But our spacecraft is able to just hide behind its sun shield all the time because it's in a very stable environment. So there's a lot of stuff you can do with a telescope that isn't Hubble, uh, that's not, in a sense, that isn't worthy of a telescope like Hubble, but that's still important science. So now somebody had to come up with a name for the follow-on mission. I leapt into the breach. So Deep Impact Astronomical Telescope Mission is what I came up with. But the big thing that is really the dream that's on my mind is, well, if we can do all this with a not very good telescope, that's all by itself out there in space that wasn't intended for this. What if we do this on purpose? What if, what if we build an intentional observatory instead of an accidental one? And so this is my dream. My dream is to wrap the sun with six telescopes orbiting the sun between Earth and Venus. Nothing gets unobserved. Anything that's out there, there's a telescope in play. Ah, you think I'm joking. But anything that's going on, there's a telescope that's in position that it could see it. You can point two telescopes at something and actually get stereo vision. You know, learn things. Now, my interest is in the solar system, but there's a lot of stuff you can do outside the solar system that way too. Uh, and one of the things we've discovered in the last few years, you know, in, in 1994, we had a comet run into the planet Jupiter, Shoemaker-Levy 9. It was an exciting event. We thought, wow, 
This is the first time this has happened in 300 years of telescopes. How could we be so lucky? Well, two years ago, it happened again. Uh, and a, some object reasonably large, we don't know. We never saw it before. It just went, hit Jupiter. Then last year, two more. It happens a lot more commonly than we think. But you have to be looking at it at the right time in order to see it happen. We could do that. Okay? I'm done there. I'm just going to leave this up here. Have I used all of my time, or is there time for like a question? Um, I always run over. Right. Um, I think if you have questions, I think it's probably best if, I'll, if you have one question. All right, come on. Yes. Let's do one question. What is the orbital period of epoxy, and, and does it ever, is it ever on the opposite side of the sun from us? It'll be on the opposite side of the sun from us in about five years. What happens is its orbit is just a little bit longer than Earth's, and so it slowly drifts with respect to Earth's orbit. And so in about five years, actually about four years, it'll be far enough around. One of the things we want to do is look for uh, Earth-crossing asteroids that you can't see from Earth. Uh, because they're still on orbits that will eventually be close to Earth that just aren't right now. Uh, and so it's an opportunity to get early warning about what's going on with Earth-crossing asteroids in the solar system, too. All right. Thanks, Tim, for an excellent presentation. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I, I, just, I just wanted to say one thing after, after Tim's presentation, because it's really a teachable moment. You know, you all responded to a call for proposals in your communities, and, and it ultimately uh, led to a flight experiment. NASA put out a call, uh, an announcement of opportunity called NIAC, right? This was in response to NIAC, right? The last thing there was a NIAC. Yes, and NIAC stands for these days because it was, it was another NIAC. It stands for? Uh, but now it's NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program. NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program. Yeah. So NASA puts word out on the street to scientists, if you have an innovative idea, propose, uh, uh, propose an experiment. Tim proposed this. And who knows how far this is going to go in the proposal review process. Maybe one day you'll be reading somewhere about a telescope array that was proposed by him so that we would have continuous observation of anything, anywhere. In, all the time. So, so this, is, this is the way it really works. What you're experiencing is the way it really works.